Good morning, Champion Life family and online. Hey, it's, a, it's going to be a great message this morning. I, I would encourage you to have expectation in your heart. So when you have expectation, that's the, that's the best opportunity to receive. Just like when you Friday comes and you're expecting your check, you should have that same expectation in your heart and receive from God this morning. God bless you. Good morning, Champion Life, to this new 9 a.m. service. How are we all doing this morning? It's very good to be here. Why don't we stand to our feet? We're going to worship King Jesus. Father God, I just thank you for this morning, and I thank you for the day that you've allowed me to be a part of, and I thank you for the people that you've brought here, Jesus. I pray that you would bless them, and I pray that you would cover this service with your love and that we would leave different, that we would leave hungry for you, changed for you, Lord, we ask that you would be in this worship and that you would bless us in your name. Yeah. 
to the king You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turned it for good Yes, you turned it for good Every time You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Yes, you turn it for good Take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take. You take what the enemy.
Father, we thank you, Father, that you are our firm foundation. Father, that we put our faith and our trust in you, oh God, that you are everything, Lord God, that you've created us to be, God, to love, to be loved, Father, in this world, Father. I thank you, God, that today we will receive that love, Father, because you were the same yesterday, today, and forever, God, and that love that you have for us, Father, that we receive it. Father, we open our hearts to receive a word that you may have for us today, oh God, because you are a faithful God. You are Jehovah Jireh, and you are the provider of all things holy in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yes, it's great seeing everybody at Champion Life Church today. Who's excited to be here? Come on, yes. Who's excited for the snow that's coming soon? Couple of you, couple of you, couple of you are like, no, nah, that's awful. But hey, Pastor Larry and Kim are doing a wedding in South Carolina. They want me to tell you hello. They love you and they miss you. And uh, you guys may be seated. It's like we're in a standing challenge here. I'm looking at everybody standing here. And it's like, who can stand the longest? I don't know. But we're going to find out. But yes, it's probably going to be me. Yeah. But, uh, but no, hey, uh, the heart of Champion Life Church, I just want to tell you that the heart of this church, right, is that Thanksgiving's coming up Thursday. And if you don't have somewhere to go, if you don't have a family to spend Thanksgiving with, there's a few homes that are open. Pastor Larry's one of them. My house is open. We would love for you to come over. There's some other homes as well. We would love for you to come over, celebrate with us on Thanksgiving, and just be a part of the Champion Life Church family because we don't want nobody celebrating 
the holidays by themselves, right? So it's so important. So I thank you guys so much for being here. And if you're new here, we'd like to see you after service at the Blue Umbrella. We have some packets for you with some gum in there because we always say we believe every champion needs fresh breath. See a little bit about the breath today and the power of the champion breath and what that's about a little later on in the message. But hey, check out this video from Pastor Larry and see what he has got to say about the new building. Church, family, how are you doing? Hey, I am so excited to be able to share with you uh, what we're going to be doing in December and January. Hey, listen, uh, I am here just looking at blueprints, and uh, this is our blueprint table uh, here at Champion Life Church. Man, there's so much work going on here. It's looking amazing. Uh, but uh, hey, I, I want to ask you, uh, to be a part of what we're call, calling Furnish the House Offering. That's right, Furnish the House. Well, we're taking this, this title from First uh, Chronicles chapter 28 and 29, where David and Solomon were asked by God to build uh, a temple for God, a place, a house for God, and, and where people were just bringing in the supplies. And so I'm asking you to participate in our Furnish the House Offering that's going to be happening in December and January with two special Sundays. Uh, all the information will be given to you uh, on this card. So it, there's three phases of this uh, to furnish the house. There's the phase of where we need furniture and equipment, right? Phase where we got we to gotta buy pews and, uh, and chairs and sound equipment. And then there's a whole basement where, where there's a kid's area where we got to have safety equipment and multimedia for kids and, and all the fixings and furnitures. Uh, that need to go to provide an awesome children's atmosphere. And then we just don't want to think about us. We don't think about giving uh, to uh, this world. And so we're having a global outreach where we'll be uh, uh, taking 10% uh, of all the money that comes in and helping uh, build a well in Nepal and do some uh, building work in India and right here in Beaver County. Man, it's just going to be awesome. So I ask you to pray about it. I ask you to get excited about it. We're also getting our kids involved, like we did the kids banks. We're doing that again, uh, where, where kids are going to have their furnished the house banks. And so, Champion Life Church, we're excited about our future. We appreciate you because, remember, this is about building people, changing lives. It's about this building here in this community to tell more people about Jesus. So, God bless you. I look forward to sharing with you all kind of incredible uh, steps uh, in these next couple of weeks. And so uh, God bless you. Hey, and I just want you to now get your heart ready because here comes Pastor Nick. He's going to share the word with you. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm that guy that was up there earlier. I'm Pastor Nick. How's everybody doing today? Good. Some of us sounds like we may have had a rough week by no response, huh? But uh, welcome to Champion Life Church. As always, I just want to take a moment and honor our pastors, Larry and Kim who are so faithful to this church and love this church. And their heart for this church is truly seen, you know, in the early morning hours when they're praying literally for each and every one of us. And that's what I love about them. And it's an honor to serve them for me, my family, and my kids, to just serve under them, to be taught by them, and to be able to love this church with them. So let's just pray for this message real quick. We'll just bow our heads. Father God, I just thank you for this time, Lord God. We know your word says where two or more are gathered in your name, you are in their midst. Father, I pray, Lord God, that we truly will receive uh, what you have to give us today. Our hearts will be open, Father, to your love, Lord God. Father, and that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth, Lord, will be pleasing in your sight, O oh God. I thank you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So how's everybody's week? Good? You know, I one of them weeks, I want to share one of them weeks that I had recently. You know, I like to share. I'm an open book. That's a, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a side joke, but he gets it. Anyway, open book. But hey, you have a great day at work. You know, everything is going well, and the dominoes are all falling in place, right? And then what happens? You come home, and your world's turned upside down. So the people, one of the people that I live with turned my world upside down when I came home, literally right at the door. So I'm going to let you guys figure out who it was. <laughs> was it my wife, 13 years, happily married? 
No? <laughs> married. <laughs> my wife married of 13 years. Happily subjective, I guess. Um, my son's 12 years old. Getting close to a teenager. Huh? That's an easy one. Safe bet. Or my other son, he's four years old. Who do you guys think it may have been? Four-year-old. You got it. My man in the front. You're good. Four-year-old ruined my life. No. No, um, I love him. But uh, I come home. He come right to the door. So I open the door. It was like I'm getting like Champion Life Church, right? As soon as you come to the door, they're opening the door for you, right? Welcome to Champion Life Church. I'm like, man, this place is super friendly. I come home. Like, never get the door open for me. Never. He's like, daddy, daddy, daddy. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, Daddy, I got an STD. I said, that's what he said. Come right to the door and said that. So I had to, you know, I draw back into that long stance. I said, I, I said I'm going to be here for a minute. I got to figure this out. I said, you got what? I had to say, make sure I heard it right. I heard it right. He said an STD. I said, okay. Well, where did you get this STD at? He said, I got it in the shed, Dad. In the shed. Now, the flesh side of me is like, wait a minute. What is going on in my shed? Did my shed turn into a brothel or something? Like, what is going on? But I'm like, wait a minute. That's the flesh side of me. I'm like, he's only four years old. I'm like, what happened? So I pull my wife aside. I'm like, can you explain this to me? How my four-year-old son got an STD in the shed? Like, I am not ready for this. She's like, well, he went down there with his brother, and he's seen the ATV. So he can only say STD. So he thinks he got an STD. In reality, it's an ATV, and he's excited about a quad that he has down there. So I'm like, I'm like okay. So as you try to explain, a little kid, four-year-old, got all kind of attitude. Pastor Nick, Pastor Nick, I'm like, oh, boy. he's tempting me, right? He's pushing me. So I'm like, come on, man. But now you know kids. What do they do? They go everywhere and they say everything. And they're excited when they get something new. So now every group of people you go around, I got an STD. And you're like, you're oh, look, is that guy a pastor? No, it's just on Sundays. It's on Sundays. But no, then you have to explain to him. It makes for a funny story, and it's a real great kind of opening conversation, obviously. A real good icebreaker. For those of you that know, I go to church on Sundays. But anyway, the title of this message, right, is there might be a seed. So the point of that story is this. The words have an ability and a power to create lasting transformation in our lives. The transformation that we're seeing comes from the words that we're saying, right? So our heart is a factory and our mouth speaks those words. So our mouth essentially is a faucet. So whatever we speak out of our mouth has the power to create literally everlasting change. If you wonder why you're always around negative people, maybe you're the one that is creating that negative environment. Could be you, right? So we have to look at that and we have to check and see what's in our heart. So when the message is called, there might be a seed, right? There might be a seed. So I will throw a disclaimer out. If I cry at all during this message, church, you know uh, I get emotional. Um, but I'm not crying because I'm sad. I'm crying or getting tears because the power of God is real and the power of God has freed me from this. And the ability that I'm able to share it with you is what touches my heart the most. And that's what will bring possibly tears to my eyes. So I want to have a moment where I'm transparent and vulnerable with you guys and share with you one of my greatest struggles that I've had, you know, as, as a man. And, um, hey, if you can't handle that a pastor has struggles or your pastor has struggles, you know, it's a real thing because pastors are this, people. We're all people, right? We're not held to any higher standard, right? By people, not by God, but just people. So one of the struggles, Pastor Larry would invite me to pastor's conferences, Right, So in a far-off land known as Monroeville, we would go, right, still going to laugh a little bit, but we would go to pastor's conferences up there at Grace Life Church, Pastor Buck, who's a board member of this church. And I would love the conferences, I would love the worship, I would love the word, and I would love growing stronger. But there's something I would absolutely detest and I would hate, and that would be having relationships with other pastors. Wow, right? Think about that. 
I would literally sit down at my meal longer so that I didn't have to talk more. Does that even sound like me? Doesn't really, right? But what there was, there was a seed in my heart that I went into default mode and I didn't recognize that this was a real thing. And I want to just honor and thank my brother Joel, who's a pastor at Edgewood Church, who didn't even know I was preaching this message today. But he's like, man, you're preaching him and Ben and they want to come and support you know, support me, man. So thank you, Joe. Let's just honor him. I believe in honoring pastors and Joe and Ben both just surrender their lives and hearts to, to serve God. And thank you guys so much for that. But it's the craziest thing, right? It's saying, wow, I struggled with those relationships. Why did I struggle with those relationships? You know, it took a lot of work. And Pastor Larry, that's what our pastors are for. They help us get to places, get through places, right? It took a lot of prayer. It took a lot of different things. So how was this impacting my life from living the, the life that God wanted me to live? So here's the thing. You ever had that feeling that you didn't belong in the room? Have you ever had that feeling? Maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't, I don't, I don't, not 100% sure that I belong here. I feel out of place. Like, I only come once every three weeks and they know that and they think, no, listen, man, you come when you can come to church. Church is just a good place. It's a place where we're family. It's like when I leave work, I go home because I want to be with my family. That's why I come to church, because I don't want to ever forsake the gathering of these amazing people, these champions, right? So if you come one every three weeks, one every four weeks, one every two months, listen, that's great that you're coming, coming to church, right? That's great. So let me just tell you this, right? If you've got some hurt, you've got to turn over some dirt. What's that mean? If you've got some hurt, you've got to turn over some dirt. So when you find that you have hurt or when you have a default mode in your life, you got to turn over the dirt. There's that beautiful picture of shovel that needs hands on it, right? So what I mean by that is you got to open up the, 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 the Bible, the Word of God, and you got to get into the Word of God because it has life that will get you through and beyond that hurt. So we got to dig deep on this one. Things just don't happen, right? So I want to talk about inner vows. I want to talk about inner vows, and we'll get... Get to open up that can of worms here in a second. But an inner vow is a self-oriented commitment made in a response to a person experience or desire in life whenever we focus a commitment inward because an inner vow we often make inner vows in response to pain or frustration in an attempt to comfort ourselves regarding the future rather than freeing us from the problem. Inner vows act as tethers that tie us to the past in an unhealthy way. I had created an inner vow as a teenager that I would be a better father than my father was to me because my grandparents raised me, my parents split up, and I've always viewed my dad, and I had no idea I was even doing this. It was rooted so deep in me, right, that I didn't even know that I was doing it. I would be a better dad than him, and that's not right, and I'm not trying to portray that my father is a bad dad. My father and mother were young. It is what it is. He's a good man. I love him, right? And I pray for our relationship to be strengthened every day, you know? So it's, it's amazing, right? But he's not about that. This wasn't about him. It was about me. And that's one of the parts that we have a hard time doing is saying that it's not the other person, that it is us, right? Because it's so much easier to tell everybody else what they've got wrong in their lives than to look in the mirror and say, wow, I've got hurt that's holding me back. It's keeping me down. So here's the problems with inner vows. They go against God's word. Instead of submitting everything to Jesus, these vows take our life away from God. Literally, it's a roadblock. Because when you come to something and the will of God is going to be ready to work, you say, nope, I'm going to be a better dad than that. I'm not going to not going to Christmas this year because I'm going to be a better dad than that. I'm not going to bless him with my presence, right? Secondly, inner vows have unforeseen effects on our lives. They have the power to pull the strongest in directions that we don't even realize, and they influence our daily decisions instead of God. And that's not healthy. Lastly, these vows are our highest levels of commitment. We swear to ourselves that we will or will not do something, and this commitment subconsciously overrides any commitment that we have to God, thus competing with Christ. Right? Some inner vows. I will never let them hurt me again. I love that one. I will never trust again. See, because trust can be earned. You've got to forgive and trust can be regained. 
but I will never trust them again. It literally separates you from having a relationship and sharing the love of God, which we we're both called to do, right? So how about this one? I will never be friends with again. How about that one? You know, so survey your hearts and see where you're at. See, you may have a seed that you don't even know is there that's causing you to go into a default mode. Because John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. Inner vows take us away from Jesus. It takes us away from doing the things that we are called to do in the will of God. Those things now can't be done because we're struggling in, our, in ourselves, right? In our heart. In Matthew, it says you can't even turn one hair gray. Like you can't literally do anything, right? So it's important to understand. So part of our vision here at Champion Life Church is that you would know Christ. That's one of our six C's. We want everybody to constantly turn the dirt, right? If you have some hurt, turn the dirt. We want everybody to know Christ, to walk in a deeper full relationship with Jesus, because that's what this life is about. When you see the life of Jesus, you see a life that faced everything that we're facing. But it's a life that also conquered the grave, conquered everything that we're facing as well. Right. And Pastor Rod, Pastor Jill preached last week and said about worth, having worth. And Pastor Rod said, talked about, you know, he had a word for the church of, you know, uh, talking about uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and how King Nebuchadnezzar said, you know, you will bow, you know, and they said, we will never bow, you know, and they said, even if our Lord doesn't save us, we will never bow. We will go into that fiery furnace. We don't care, right? So how do we get to that even if mentality, right? We're going to go to the even if mentality. So I'm going to start off by jumping into Genesis 26. And God said, let us make human beings in our image. To be like us, they will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky and the livestock, all the wild animals on earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. This is the first time in Genesis that God says, let us, us. So it shows it's just not God, right? He's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He said, let us. So let us make human beings in our image to be like us, to be like the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. We were created in the image of God to be like God and to reign over this world, right? It's like, this is in Genesis 1. I don't got to go back there. No, we do got to go back there because this is foundational stuff, right? Seems like, no, I'm beyond that as a Christian. But are you? Because it's in the Bible. As Christians, we can't beyond it, be beyond anything in the Bible, right? Let's go back to it. So verse 27 says this. So God said, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them, okay? So I want to look at the word created. As I was studying this and looking at this, it started from Isaiah, then God leads you to here, then God leads you to here, then God leads you to here. As I was studying the word created, it's the Greek word bara, like, get it, bara? Let's say it using a sense. If you bara my wheelbarrow, you better bring it back. <laughs> kind of like that, bara, but not spelled the same, B-A-R-A, right? You know who you are if you're watching online. No, say that. I'm losing track. I'm losing track. Anyway, um, ruin it back in. But so bara, this usage of bara means created, right? Means form, means feel. There's many different words that are associated with that word. So you find the in the context of that word, you find that word used in First Samuel two twenty nine. First Samuel two twenty nine. Just the pull this verse together anyway it talks about it talks about getting fat from all the blessings that you're eating so it's the only other time there is created and then in, in first samuel 2 29 talks about getting fat or being filled right so we know this so we know creation happens from nothing right and that god created us from the dust of the earth so created just probably be wouldn't be the best usage of that word so sometimes when we get into modern translation Sometimes miss the mark just a little bit, but it's still not enough to say it's not a salvation thing or anything like that, right? So when you look at that and you say, oh, well, filled is the more proper usage because it's talking about filled. It's talking about inside, full or fattened, right? So let's read it in that context as you see that. So God filled human beings with his own image. In the image of God, he 
filled them, male and female, he filled them. And that just changed my life. I've got to be honest. It's so simple, but it literally changed my life. Because now I know I'm not only created on the outside to be like God, but I know that God, right, blew into my lungs and filled me with everything that he was. And he didn't do it with anything else in creation. So he made us stand specifically apart for a reason. So I'm not just walking around trying to look like a man of God. The reason that I'm able to share that I have struggles is because I'm filled with God and I'm comfortable in who I am to say, you know what? Hey, I'm not perfect, but he sees me as perfect and he loves me and I'm filled with every bit of who he is. So when the Bible says likeness, right, the detail alone confirms that God set us apart from creation because we're in his likeness. He didn't create creation in his likeness. Okay, God created us in his image so we could have meaningful relationships. So the way that we are, God created us that way specifically to have relationship with him. That's what this is about. A relationship that even angels can't enjoy. It's pretty amazing, right? Jesus was the perfect example of what a man created in God's image could achieve in relationship. Relationships, that key word. Where are you in your relationships? It is by faith in Christ that we become born again into the family of God, and we are called God's children. Initially, right, we're God's creation. We don't all walk around saying we're God's children. Unless you believe that Jesus Christ says the only way to the Father is through the Son. Unless you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you are not God's child. You are God's creation. But God wants you to make that decision so that you can become God's child, right? Because it's a choice. So we know it says on the seventh day that God rested. We're going to look at the word rested. God didn't need rest, right? He's spirit. So it doesn't need rest. So it actually says the word would be ceased. He stopped because everything that he needed created, everything was done. Boom. Ready to go into motion. God stopped on the seventh day, right? So remember the Sabbath or Shabbat. So the ultimate purpose was not to provide us with just physical rest. It's the same as getting baptized isn't making us clean, isn't because we need clean bodies. It's a different significance of a spiritual event happening there. Because even when we rest, aren't we still thinking, or am I the only one that's like, as soon as I sit down, I'm like, I'm going to have a quiet time with God. My mind literally goes into, oh, yeah, i got to wash the truck, fill fill the truck up with gas. It's like, that's my quiet time with God, is dealing with all my problems first and leaving God just a little bit at the end. Has anybody ever done that? Because it's a real thing. Like, if you go into quiet time with God and that happens to you, guess what? We're all in the same boat, you know? It's a rough go, but you've got to sort through that and you've got to overcome, you've got to overcome the flesh there. So 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new create, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Wow. Hebrews 10, 11. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Hebrews 10, 12. But he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all times, sat down at the right hand of God. So loose translation, you know I like loose translations at times. So alligator arms. Does everybody know what alligator arms are? See, you didn't even notice that it happened, that I'm standing up here with alligator arms. You're like, how did that happen? He went up there when he started and he looked normal. Now he has alligator arms, right? So alligator arms, you journey students will get alligator arms. You just get it. See, they're really short and they're awkward looking. And then alligators do their thing. I think they're very fast in straight lines. I don't know much about alligators, but anyway... What I'm saying is, I don't really care about alligators, to be completely honest. But alligator arms is like this, right? So that scripture says, He, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. So what it is, if we're all out to eat, right? Jesus is with us, and the bill comes. You know, alligator arms also come. You're like, I got that. Hold up. Let me get that. I did that to you when we ate breakfast that day. Remember that? I pulled up real short. I said, ma'am, I got it. I got it. Give it to me. Give it to me. 
right? But you get those alligator arms. Now you know I did it. I was like, ah, this just shoulder. He's like, well, why don't you pray over it? I'm like, no, don't pray over it. Then I'm going to start paying for meals. I'm not doing that. So, so you get these alligator arms. But what that scripture is telling us, that Jesus paid it. Jesus is sitting out in the car in the heated seats, just waiting us for us to come out and sit in that car with him and be a part of what he's doing. But we sit here with these alligator arms like, thank you for paying for that meal. Let me clear the table. No, let me leave the tip. No, you don't have to do anything because Jesus paid for it all. And he's in the car and he's ready to go. And he's just looking for you to say like, hey, come." his arms are back. His, he's just looking for you to say, hey, come and have a relationship with me. Right? He just wants you to get in a car because alligator arms is works righteousness and not faith righteousness. It's like, no, I can do something. Jesus, I can clear this table. You can't clear the table with alligator arms. Just get in the car because Jesus is like, hey, I paid it all. I left a tip, cleared the table. I blessed that lady. Right? Thank you, Jesus. Where am I at? So, so man's rest on the Sabbath, right, is only temporary. And think about it like this. The Sabbath is to see the rest that we have in Jesus Christ. That's what the Sabbath is, to to understand the rest that we have in Jesus Christ. So the point is this. When you understand origin, right, you can start to overcome obstacles when you understand origin. So go back to the origin. So there's a question that's answered in all of this. That question is, how do I know God wants me? Well, God created you in his image, right? So Father, Son, Holy Spirit existed. He didn't need anything else, but he said, no, I want something, and I want to create that something in my image because I love them. Each and every person here was created in that image of God because he loves you and because he wants to have a relationship with you. Trust me, he was on vacation in a retirement home, like like, like the sun on the beach and all this beautiful stuff. And he was like, no, you know what? I'm done with that. I want these people. I want each and every one of their heart, their hearts. Right. So second is this. He redeemed you with his blood. God sent Jesus, his one and only son, to pay the penalty for our sins by dying on a cross. So according to Hebrews 9, 22, it says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Right. And without the forgiveness of sins, we would be doomed forever. So that's why Jesus's blood had to be shed. Page six, for those of you tracking. Third is this. He perfected you by his grace, his ability, right? How can a perfect God have a relationship with an imperfect person? First John 1.17 says this. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Jesus' blood covers all failures, all of our failures. There's not one failure it doesn't cover and shortcomings. It makes us perfect in God's sight. You know, sometimes I like to go to the NGV version of the Bible. For those of you that don't know, that is the Nick Giles version. So to sum that up, is God doesn't wear Ray-Bans, God wears J-Bans. Think about it like this. God doesn't look at you through as the world sees. He looks at you through the lenses of Jesus. And he sees his son who died and took your sin so that you no longer have it. Because if he takes it, then you can't have it, right? So he's looking at you through J-Bans, through the lens of Jesus. That's why I love our God. So the point is this. God formed and filled you and wants a relationship with you. So I want to take a look at Eve in Genesis 3. So for all you ladies out there. No. But, the, but the, serpent, the serpent said, did God really say you must not eat from the fruit of any of these trees in the garden? Of course we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only from the fruit in the tree of the middle of the garden we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat even touch it or you will die did god say that what's in the bible gotta be true well it's not about you know it's it's in the bible but it's not true because we look at genesis 2 16 that was her perspective of this because god said that to adam husbands we have a responsibility to lead our wives we have a responsibility and women you have a responsibility to know the word of god and study the word of god but we have a responsibility to help our wives with the word of god as well because eve didn't know it because god's actual word in genesis 2 16 says But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat from every fruit tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do eat its fruit, 
you are sure to die. God said, if you do. See, that's what I love about God is God's got a free choice. If he said there's no fruit, don't eat it, or you're going to die, that's what Eve's perception was. God didn't say that. He said, hey, you know, don't eat from that tree. If you do, you'll surely die. They ate from the tree. We know that. Did they die physically? No, they died spiritually, right? So that, that was the thing. So a couple of things here. Obviously, the woman wasn't familiar with God's word. So here's the point. When we don't know God's word well enough, we change it, right? When we change it, we don't make it less restrict, restrictive. We make it more restrictive. We make it more legalistic. We assume that God said, don't eat from that. Don't do that, right? So we make it more legalistic. Well, here, let me tell you a little something about legalism. Legalism isn't a rake that brings people to Jesus. Legalism is a leaf blower that pushes people away from Jesus. If you've ever <laughs> been with someone that's legalistic, I've been to places where I've literally been shaken taking communion because they've told me, we just talked about this this morning, the word from the Lord. They literally tell me how many times that if I eat that and am not right with God and saved and all these different things, and I'm like, oh, 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 can't quit working. Go back to the alligator because I don't want to eat. I can't, you know, so I'm like, I'm going to eat this thing and not care, right? So the Bible says an eye for an eye. That's why we got to know Scripture. An eye for an eye doesn't mean, you know, it means the punishment should fit the crime. It doesn't mean they wronged me and I'm going to go get them. I'm going to go out in between services and slice someone's tires. Who wants their tires sliced? I see no hands going up. Would I do that? No. But that's why we have ushers at Champion Life Church. <laughs> They would do that for me because they love me. Say something. Say something. That's what we do. Sorry about that. I'm sure they don't do that. <laughs> so the point is, if we change the way God's word is wrote, then we change the way God's word works, making it obsolete. So do not change the way God's word is wrote. So we see how Eve did not accurately know the word of God. So let's look at Jesus who was the word of God. And let's look at this passage where Jesus was tempted by the devil for 40 days in Luke 4. Some general info. Jesus felt the emotions of a man, temptations of the flesh, and knew what physical pain was. Those of you that play basketball on Tuesday in the connect groups, Wednesday, we're older guys. You know what physical pain is. Am I right? A couple of you guys shouldn't have too much pride back there not to even shake your head. Yeah, I got you. I feel you. I feel that pride. Might be the seed. But, uh, he was also limited by the physical nature in that he relied on the spirit to guide him for comfort and to strengthen him. We don't know what Jesus was going through, but we could imagine that he was going through every temptation that a man would go through. So everything that we could have ever experienced, he experienced. We have the same spiritual resources today that Jesus had then to defeat Satan. First of which is prayer, right? First of which is prayer. We have that. Second of which is the father's love. Before Jesus even started his ministry, when he was baptized, God said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. When you accept Jesus, God looks at you without doing anything and says, you are my son, you're my daughter with whom I am pleased, whom I love, right? God's love. Third is the power of the spirit. We have the power of the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Absolutely amazing. And we have the word of God, right? We know in this passage, Jesus said, it is written. It is written. It is written. We have the word of God. But we also have as a little bonus, like, oh, they brought me the wrong order. But they're like, you can keep it. Right. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, oh, Brussels sprouts. Thank you. Jesus, I love I love bonus Brussels sprouts. I don't know why I went there, but I love them. Brussels sprouts drizzled with balsamic and, and roasted and fried like, oh, I'm like, I feel like I'm eating healthy, but I still feel like I'm not because they're drizzled in olive oil. But I'm eating my part for my doctor. But anyway, so so it's like you get that you get that bonus stuff. Now I'm completely lost with where I am. Right. But anyway, we got the bonus stuff. We have Jesus, who we know earlier, says seated at the right hand of God, literally interceding for us. Because we see when Stephen was stoned, it said Jesus was standing. He was literally interceding. Right. So he intercedes for each of us. So it's amazing. After 40 days, Jesus was at his lowest point. Without the strength of the spirit, probably wouldn't even have been able to stand. Do we see how the temptation to eat in the face of hunger also seems very similar to the temptation to eat the fruit from the tree in the garden. Similarities there. 
Have we ever dealt with exceptionally hungry people? Has anybody ever dealt with a hungry people? One of the people in my household, I'm not going to mention any names, but when she gets hungry, <laughs> I'm not mentioning any names, I'm not singling it out, but when she gets hungry, she also becomes hangry. This is a real thing. It's a real thing. So when she gets hungry, she becomes angry, thus creating a hangry person, thus creating what I thought was a truck is now turned into a ticking time bomb waiting for an explosion to happen every time I drive past a fast food restaurant like you could have stopped. So it becomes a cage. And now I'm in a cage and one of the most violent situations. Read Daniel in the lion's den. This is that happening. Men, we go through it all the time. You're sitting there driving to fear God. You don't even want to look over. You know what I'm talking about, right? Some of you men are froze up and you're looking forward. That means, women, I know your husband's telling me without telling me. Let me tell you a little man talk. Telling me you're a hangry person. And you get upset and freak out, right? So... Happily married. <laughs> happy wife. Yeah, I love it. Happy wife. Happy life. So, yeah, that's that. So, you know, Jesus had to be hungry. <laughs> think about a couple things. When you're hungry, you literally think about nothing else but food, as in the truck ride, right? That's all I hear about. You could have stopped there. You could call somewhere and order something for me if you were a good husband. It's like they go right to the playbook. And the playbook, it's like, where do you women get this? You know, but those of you men that have a problem with that, you also got to recognize that God took from us the parts that created our lovely wives. So those are the parts that were in you. So those are your parts too. So we were hangry at some point, I would think. So anyway, when Scripture speaks of crucifying the flesh, talks about this struggle the struggle to resist what the body will want by its nature to listen to what the Scripture directs. Scripture tells us the struggles of living a godly life come down to the fight between, within us between a sinful body we still occupy and a new spirit we've been given by God. This fight is one that can be won, but only if we train ourselves. It's not magic. It's work. It's work. If you want different, you've got to do different. I've always said that. If you want different, you got to do different. <clears throat> I want to read this, 1 Corinthians 9, 24. It says, do you not know that in a race, all runners run, but only one gets a prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do not get a crown that will last, but they, we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified of the prize. I can relate with this. Some of you are thinking, how? Because he doesn't have a, body, a runner of a body, right? A runner's body, they call it, I think. I, yeah, I get it. I don't. But I have runner's eyes. <laughs> what that means? It means I watched this beautiful Kenyan man in the Olympics run that thing. I could sit on my couch and watch that. You know, he won it this Olympics and he won it last Olympics. You think he did that by, by chance? Because he dealt, he dealt blows to his body. That's why he's able to do it. That's amazing. So, right, if we expect to win in all of our spiritual battles, we desire by wishing and, by wishing and hoping we're not being realistic with ourselves. So by delivering Jesus over this 40-day fast, God was placing Jesus in a position where his reliance on God and the Spirit was undeniable. Undeniable, right? Jesus' body, though, that had no sin, still had fleshly desires for food. But we see Jesus still disciplined his body to obey the Spirit. Our culture has lost an appreciation for the connection between a regular discipline over the desires of the flesh, right, and our spiritual walk as Christians. Just think about that. Galatians 5.16 says, So I walk, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Gratify, someone say. For the flesh the desires, what is contrary in the spirit, and the spirit, what's contrary to the flesh. They in the conflict with each other so that they are not able to do whatever you want. Satan uses the oldest trick in a book, a book he's been using, the trick that he's been using since the garden, right? We've heard the old, oldest trick in a book. Where do you think that comes from? 
just think it comes from the Bible. I don't know. Because Satan uses the oldest trick in the book. So Jesus' first temptation from Satan was an attack on God's love since his beloved son was hungry. See? It was an attack on his love. I thought that was pretty good. The point is this. What digestion is to the body, meditation is for the soul. Now, he takes Jesus to a point where he can see all the world's kingdoms, kingdoms, promises them. You can have all you see. Pretty wild, right? How can he do it? Well, Adam sinned. He lost dominion over the world, so he can, he can do that. That doesn't seem like much of a temptation, does it? You can have all you see. Do you know, that was the reason that Jesus came. That's why it was an amazing temptation. Because Jesus came, right, to redeem and to purchase and to gain control over this world. Because what the devil says, hey, you can have everything you say. Well, that's an easy one. No, nah, Jesus just resisted that. That would, you realize what that would have did if Jesus would have accepted there? That would have removed him from the worst beating and death that the world has ever seen. But no, when he seen that, there was a different image that Jesus seen. Not just what the devil was showing him. There was an image. And it's the image that you see when you look in the mirror in the morning. That's the image that Jesus seen when he said no. Because he wanted to be obedient to God because he loved you and he knew the cross was his. Right? Page 10, almost done for those of you keeping track. Those of you like, come on, got to get home. Football games at 820. Satan questions is Jesus' hope, right? So here we go. Here we go. Let's, 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 when he took Jesus to the top of the temple. The devil's quoting Psalm 91, and what he does, what the devil does is someone that knows Scripture is he tries to twist the Scripture. And that's what he did. He tried to twist the Scripture, right? So to sum that up <clears throat> real quick, to wrap it up, this is the one thing that I've never seen. In my version, it says, it is written, it is written, it is written. But when you go back into a King James or into a new King James, and you see it's the closest manuscript, it actually says, it is written, it is written, it is said. So I believe that there is power. I believe that there is a reason that it is supposed to be that way because I have a Bible and I know there's a bunch of things that are written in there, right? But it's not until the point that it goes into my heart and I fully believe it, that I speak it from my mouth. Jesus said, it is said. And the devil fleed from him until another opportune time because he knew he had no chance there. So we have to not just read the word of God, but through the meditation right? Deliver and blows to the flesh. We have to speak it because Jesus said, it is said. And that's powerful, right? So in this third case of temptation, Satan tried to attack God's faithfulness, thus attacking three virtues of Christian life, faith, hope, and love. Food was love, right? Give him all the kingdoms. That was the hope, right? And faith in God. Right? So he tried to attack all three. Romans 5.19 says this, because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. At the end of the third temptation, where it says he waited for an opportune time, that's where, that's where, the, where the enemy... i got to get my Bible, huh? Who comes to church to preach without a Bible? Who does that? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway... So that's where, that's where Satan tries to come through other people. And we see where, where he tried to get Judas, right? Where he got Judas, actually. But Jesus was where we exactly, maybe where we are, maybe where we've been, maybe where we will be. Jesus was all those places. The point is this. Jesus is the supreme example of what can happen to someone's life through a relationship with God, our Father. He will take you from point A to point, we'll just say V instead of Z because it's victory. Right? So we're going to wrap this up. We're going to wrap this up in John 18 when we see the spoken word. After saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kindron Valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. Judas, the betrayer, knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and a temple guards to accompany him. Now, with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Do you know why they had blazing torches and lanterns? Because they thought Jesus was a coward. They thought Jesus was going to be hiding in a cave. They thought Jesus was going to be avoiding them and running from them. 
Jesus isn't a coward. When Jesus sees you, he steps towards you, right? Just like it says in here, it says, Jesus didn't run. The word of God says he stepped forward to meet them. And he said, who is it that you are looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. He said, I am he. He didn't step back away from the challenge, away from the death on the cross for you. He said, I am he. And what it says in the next part, those were literally three words, right? I am he. It says those men, 500 of them, withdrew back and fell to the ground because the word of God is the power of God. How did they still step forward to persecute Jesus? I have no idea if someone spoke, I am he, and it pushed me back to the ground and knocked me over. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So the one thing is to believe God for the promise, but it's another thing to trust God through the process. There's a process, right? Forgiveness isn't based on you. When you accept Jesus, it's placed on you. That's powerful stuff. The verse that God gave me was in Isaiah 43. It said, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through the waters, he says, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they will not overtake you. When you go through the fires, when you walk specifically, since we're talking about words, it says walk. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Why? Because he says, I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel. That's what the Bible says. The water, right, is something that overcomes us, the struggles of life. And the fire is something that consumes us if we have something in our lives that's consuming us. Jesus said, you don't got to run. You got to walk. It says in Isaiah specifically, I'm walking. You don't got to run because running has fear and doubt. We're going to walk. We're going to get through this thing. Whatever you've got going on in your life, at what point do we step into the word of God as Jesus said it and we can say it? I am called. I am confident. I am courageous. I am chosen. I am bold. I am qualified. I am a son of God. I am righteous. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are the good shepherd God and you will be with me. Church, it's time to know that you belong in the room. It's time to tear the seed out of your heart and say, I belong in this room because I am a son or a daughter of God. And I will no longer let what the devil means for bad to be used in my life because God is good and you are faithful and he walks with you. Glory to God. That's it for me. But let's rise, guys. Let's rise. Let's just let it be what it is. But as we go into this time, guys, when we rise and we go into this last worship time song, if you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, the time is now. The time is now to do it. With all of our heads bowed, if we can turn the lights down, guys, if we can turn the lights down. The time is now, guys, with our heads bowed. If you've never made that decision to accept Jesus Christ, I just ask that you raise your hand. On the count of three, I just ask that you raise your hand. One, two, three, raise your hand. If you want to reconnect with Jesus, thank you. Thank you, you can put it down. If you want to reconnect your heart and life with Jesus, you can raise your hand. Listen, it's just not for people that never experienced the love of God. This is for everybody. How about this? If you love Jesus, just put your hand up. We're all family. We're all brothers. Yes, I love y'all so much. I thank you guys. I thank you guys. Father, I thank you for this word that has fallen upon us, God. You are amazing. You are magnificent, oh God. We love you, Father. We love you, Father, with everything that we are. We thank you, God, that you have created us. You have filled us, Father, and that you walk with us. Thank you for your power, Holy Spirit, God, that guides us and leads us. 
I thank you, brothers and sisters, those of you that raised your hand to accept Jesus Christ. It says in the Bible, when one sinner repents, the angels in heaven rejoice. There is a party for you today in heaven because you have repented. Let's just say this prayer together if you raise your hand. Father God, I am a sinner. But I am saved by your grace, oh God. I repent of my sin. I turn from my wicked ways. I seek your face, oh God. And just believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that he died for me. And that you rose him from the grave for me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we go into this time of reflection, let's just sing this last song, guys, and let's just worship our Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you for that word this morning. Lord, we humble, we come humbly before you this morning, God. And we reminded that you are the potter and we are just the clay, God. And we are all imperfect people. Father, do what you do best. Restore, build, encourage, lift up, heal, mend. And we thank you, Lord. We bless your name this morning in Jesus' mighty name. And match his name. Amen and amen. Amen. Put your hands together this morning for the Lord. And for that great word Pastor Nick brought this morning. We so appreciate that. My name is Will, a.k.a. Chili Willie Cheesesteaks. Amen. Hey, um, hey I want to, we, uh, uh, Champion Life wants to thank you for your giving. Amen. Um, your giving has been so good that. Uh, we have so many Thanksgiving baskets that we need you guys to, if you know anyone that needs a basket or needs some help, please leave the name back there in the back or email the office, okay? Also, we also need, tomorrow is assembly and delivery at 6 p.m. at the church, at the, um, the office, 
at the office tomorrow, 6 p.m. If you didn't have opportunity to give, you can give of your time. Amen. Also, the third thing is next Sunday is Thanksgiving Appreciation Gratitude Service. Amen. We are going to be having testimonies and stories of, of the goodness of God. Amen. And it's always good to be reminded how God, how good God is. Amen. When you're going through the tough times, always be mindful of the many times that God has brought you out. Also, next Sunday is the last time to purchase a sweatshirt, a Champion Life sweatshirt. And I'm going to make sure I get mine in. They are so cool. I mean, yeah, they, they're cool. They're real cool. You know, so get one of those. Please do. Um, also, okay, here. Now, what we always do here is our blessing prayer. And we always say this together. It's good to do this. Amen. Let's say it together. We are deeply blessed, highly favored, unconditionally loved, and filled with divine purpose. Amen. Thank you, uh, people of God. Also, if you need prayer, there's going to be some people on the side of each of this mess, uh, church here that you can go up for prayer. Amen. Thank you. See you later.